Good evening and welcome. Um, it's a real uh, honor uh, to have uh, the Honorable Sean Donovan here with us. He is uh, among a lot of friends. I um, feel as if I just saw him yesterday here at the GSD, uh, though it's quite a while ago when he was here. I think his incredible generosity, his manner, his smile, his intelligence is something that's really very hard to, uh, to forget. Um, and I think so many of us have incredible memories of his time here as uh, a student. And uh, it's such an honor for us to uh, witness the incredible contribution that uh, Sean has made broadly to the field of housing in New York City now at the government level, and I'm sure that uh, you will go on and do wonderful things for, for the nation, really, in the years to come. So thank you very much for being here. I'm also here to uh, thank you all for being here and to thank the National Housing Endowment and, of course, our Joint Center for Housing Studies, the Policy Advisory Board representatives who are here for supporting the 10th Annual John T. Dunlop Lecture. I had the great fortune of meeting with uh, Mr. Bruce Carbonari this morning. I know that uh, the advisory board is doing really amazing things and look forward to many future collaborations with the board and uh, the school. I'd also like to thank uh, my uh, um, friend and uh, the dean of uh, the Harvard Kennedy School, David Elwood, um, and uh, Rick Pizer, my colleague uh, of the Real Estate Academic Initiative for co-sponsoring this lecture. The Joint Center for Housing Studies is an important and meaningful uh, collaboration uh, between the worlds of planning and policy at the GSD and the Harvard Kennedy School, and between uh, the worlds of business and that of the academy. For the past uh, 50 years, and still today, the Joint Center for Housing Studies has been an essential provider of research and analysis that informs and illuminates critical dialogue about housing strategies and solutions here at Harvard, at the national level, and increasingly around the world. The GSD is, of course, also very much involved with a whole range of uh, initiatives across the university and across all of our departments. For those of you who participated in our Ecological Urbanism Conference last year, you know that we are very much committed to constructing a much more holistic approach towards the full domain of design as it engages with social, political, cultural issues uh, across the globe. And we're actually looking to find specific new methods and methodologies that can really make it possible for us to address such important issues as sustainability, urban ecology, rural issues, uh, the politically and socially engaged forms of practice, the impact of technology, the role of infrastructure in our society. So all of these are really challenges that I think we have to uh, begin to think much more systematically in terms of their overall impact on the way that we uh, practice today. Without any doubt, we need to, of course, uh, work together in a collaborative fashion, and as we have been saying at the school, in a way that is uh, truly cross-disciplinary and, in fact, transdisciplinary in terms of its possibilities, in terms of its new potentials. The area of housing is something that has always been an area of real importance. I feel very committed to the idea of actually bringing the domains of, of policy and projects much more closely together at the school to really try and connect the worlds of design and those of, of, of research that happens, for example, in the context of the Joint Center in, in, in the next few years, so that we can really try and be as helpful as collaborative, but also for ourselves, really understand the challenges that are facing us uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, social and political issues, and how can we, through the domain of, of of design and the role of, of uh, the various disciplines that are in place in the school actually move closer towards providing new and 
productive and meaningful solutions. I very much hope that our work will be anticipatory and projective and look forward to collaborations with many of the people who are here in this room. I would now like to welcome uh, Nicholas Retsinas, director of Harvard University's Joint Center for Housing Studies. Uh, Nick has been the director since 1998 to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Dean Mustafavi, thank you for those kind words, your words of welcome, and for your support and for your leadership. We appreciate all of that. This is the 10th annual John Dunlop Lecture, named in honor of a very special person, Professor John Dunlop. Uh, we have had a distinguished list of speakers over the years, of which tonight, really in many ways, is a, really a, a classic sort of a presentation of the lecture. Along with us throughout this decade has been the support of the National Housing Endowment. The National Housing Endowment is the philanthropic arm of the National Association of Home Builders, and here to bring greetings of the endowment and the National Association of Home Builders is its chairman, Gary Grzynski. Gary? Thank you, Nick. Uh, I don't have to tell Harvard that it's been a challenging year for endowments. <laughs> and uh, I think the same holds true for uh, the National Housing Endowment, uh, the philanthropic arm of NAHB. But despite uh, the difficulty in, in raising money these days, the uh, NAHB and its uh, housing endowment has remained staunchly behind its partnership with the Joint Center as evidenced by our co-sponsorship in the spring of the State of the Nation's Housing Industry Report and also here in the fall by our primary sponsorship of the Dunlop Lecture. It's a fitting remor uh, memorial to uh, Professor Dunlop who sat on our first Board of Trustees at the endowment. And the lecture endeavors to, to bring housing luminaries from both the public and the private sector together uh, to share their thoughts with industry leaders and tonight with a lot of students on how we, continue, how we can continue to advance housing in America. Tonight that exception, no exception to that list of luminaries, is uh, the Obama administration's point person, point person on housing, the Honorable Sean Donovan, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. And I could tell you uh, from our experience at the National Association of Home Builders, uh, the Secretary has been very willing to open his office and share a dialogue with our industry leaders uh, in several sessions uh, since he has taken office. So tonight I invite all of you to listen, to learn, and those of you who are leaders to lead housing back to its rightful place as a building block of this country and economic prosperity. And with that, again, greetings and welcome, and back to Nick. Harry, thank you, and thank the members of the board of the National Housing Endowment. I want to especially acknowledge the members of the Policy Advisory Board of the Joint Center, many of whom are here this evening. Thank you for su your support. I also want to acknowledge the members of the Joint Center family, both past and present, who are here to say hello to a, a former colleague. And of course, my colleagues on the faculty at the Design School and throughout the university. Um, this is a special night. This is a special moment. This is the 50th anniversary of the Joint Center for Housing Studies. It is the 10th anniversary of the John Dunlop Lecture. As we prepared for those auspicious dates and tried to think who best could represent and epitomize all that the Joint Center has contributed and all the ways in which Professor Dunlop exemplified how public and private sectors came together, there really weren't too many places we look for. Even at Harvard, people use cliches. And one of the famous cliches that's often used around here is when the student is ready, the teacher will come. It's an old Buddhist saying, and it's very apropos. It's very apropos with our speaker tonight. If I can think of any time in our nation's history where housing was more important, I just can't think of it. If I can think of any time in our nation's history when we didn't come to realize the importance of housing not only to families, but to communities and to our economies, I can't think of it. 
I can't think of any time in our nation's history where housing was more broken than it is today. The statistics on starts, on sales, on people losing their homes are legendary and frightening. What better time to have someone step to the forefront and say, I am ready to serve, Mr. President. I am ready to take on this awesome responsibility that is more than just administering a cabinet department, as awesome as that responsibility, but a responsibility that speaks literally to the future of our nation to life as we know it, to our communities, how they evolve, and to our families, and how they emerge from this problem that we are in. At the same time, more than by luck, I suspect, our speaker happens to exemplify someone who has been able to go through the academic community. He is the holder of a master's degree in architecture and a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University who has an incredible public sector experience both at the federal level and at the, as commissioner of development, as housing development in the city of New York. Um, I've had the opportunity a couple times over this past year to introduce the secretary and the world that always comes to mind, and I repeat myself, is we're really lucky. <laughs> we're really lucky at this particular point in time. We have a person uniquely qualified, uniquely positioned, and with a unique passion to take on the challenges ahead. It is a great pleasure to introduce the Honorable Sean Donovan, Secretary of the United States Department of Urban Development. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, it is very, very special to be here at Harvard where uh, it all began for me in so many ways. And I want to thank you all for an incredibly warm welcome. Um, Nick continues in a long line of brilliant minds leading the Joint Center. And of all the things that I could say about Nick uh, tonight, and there are many, uh, what I will say in particular, Nick, is that at the moment that I came into public service for the first time, uh, very unexpectedly, by happenstance in many ways, even though I had graduated not only from the GSD but the Kennedy School of Government, for God's sake, uh, never thought about pursuing a career in government, but watched you as the Federal Housing Commissioner, and not only did my interest grow in joining the public sector, but I saw what a great leader could be in the public sector. And so thank you for many, many years of mentorship and leadership that you've provided, not only to the housing world, but to me personally. Thank you. Um, I also want to say thank you to Moisten for a very, very kind introduction. It is funny to hear you say, in a room where I remember sitting, I think, right there <laughs> during my first critique uh, as an architecture student here, watching one of my fellow students literally fall asleep in the middle of his own review uh, of his project, uh, that I always looked bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and, and smiling uh, during my career here. So uh, I appreciate hearing that. I'm not sure it was always true. Uh, but it does bring back very fond memories to see you and to see how your own career has grown and the kind of incredible leadership that you're providing today uh, to this school during a very, very important time. So thank you for the introduction. Um, I also do want to say a special word uh, about John Meyer, who passed away recently, uh, having not only made enormous contributions to the field of urban economics, but also a leading role in creating this series. As we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Joint Center, it's clear that students and faculty here have a unique appreciation for the value and importance, as Moisen talked about, of unconventional interdisciplinary thinking and policy innovation. Indeed, my own perspective on housing policy was fundamentally shaped by my education, not just at the Kennedy School, but at the design school as well. Some of you may know that I served as Bill Apgar's teaching assistant when he was at the Joint Center. And it was John Updike who said, four years was enough of Harvard. I still had a lot to learn, but had been given the liberating notion that now I could teach myself. Well, obviously, I didn't read enough Updike because it took me eight and a half years to have enough of Harvard. 
But per, for Bill, I think it was precisely the length of my graduate studies between a master's degree in architecture and a master's degree in public administration that appealed to him when it came to picking TAs. Because as a first year graduate student, I could achieve in the future a certain level of indentured servitude, shall we say. Uh, so I spent a lot of years at the Joint Center, and they were wonderful years. Um, in, in, in fact, it was my education here that allowed me to travel the path that I have, not only to the public sector, but to so many other places, beginning as an architect, moving into the nonprofit world at the Community Preservation Corporation in New York City, to the private sector, where I led Prudential's Affordable Housing Group, and then on to academia for a short time at the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy as a visiting scholar, before returning to the public sector as housing commissioner in New York and, and to my current role. At every stage, inside of government and out, it was the bridge between the policy-based thinking of the Kennedy School and the place-based thinking of the Graduate School of Design, a bridge central to the creation of the Joint Center that enabled me to see the broader picture. What hooked me on housing in particular when I took Bill Apgar's class was the way that housing connected to everything else in a family's life. This idea that when you choose a home, you don't just choose a home. You also choose transportation to work, schools for your children, public safety. You choose a community and the choices available in that community. In housing, I saw the place-based connection between the built environment and access to opportunity, health, and well-being. Tonight, I want to outline how this sense of place-based thinking nurtured by the Joint Center needs to take center stage in our federal housing policy. As we speak, this is an extraordinary moment for housing in this nation. Millions of foreclosures have sent America's economy into a tailspin, the likes of which we haven't seen in 80 years, and from which we are only now beginning to recover. As a consequence, the federal government has had to intervene on a scope and scale not seen since the Great Depression. First, there has been an aggressive effort by the Federal Reserve and Treasury to drive down interest rates through monetary and tax policy and by buying up mortgage-backed securities. As a result, interest rates have hovered at or below 5% for six months, allowing first-time homebuyers to enter the market and helping some 3 million homeowners refinance, putting as much as $10 billion of purchasing power in the hands of American households every year. There was the dramatic decision to take Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac into conservatorship. Combined with the counter-cyclical access to credit offered by the Federal Housing Administration, these institutions are responsible for 95% of new mortgages today. Together, Treasury and HUD unveiled the foreclosure prevention program, making home affordable, as neighborhood stabilization funds flowed to communities suffering from the effects of concentrated foreclosures. And finally, the Recovery Act passed, an unprecedented fiscal stimulus the Recovery Act is pumping $787 billion into communities around the country to keep our economy going and to create jobs. As important as it was to pull us back from, from a crisis caused by reckless lending and regulatory abdication, the nature of this crisis has also revealed the need for a new direction. It revealed the dramatic gap between wages and housing prices, which easy credit through so-called financial innovation failed to close. It pulled back the curtain on the unsustainable nature of our growth, how supposedly affordable homes built in new neighborhoods turned out not to be affordable at all because of the distended nature of our metro areas and the mismatch between where people live and where jobs are located. And it highlighted the fragility of many communities as foreclosures in urban cores of older industrial cities rolled back 15 years of gains in neighborhood revitalization. The disparate impact of subprime mortgages on people of color has resulted in a dramatic drop in home ownership rates for African Americans and Latinos. It's clear from the wreckage of our economy that we must forge a new direction for housing. That requires the federal government to set a new course that is focused on place. For 50 years since the Joint Center's founding, housing policy debates have often been about people versus neighborhoods, supply versus demand, public versus private, home ownership versus rental. No doubt these debates have merit. But once we begin to see all these debates through the lens of place, these abstract arguments begin to come into focus. Traditional ideologies lose their edge. We see the interactions more clearly between housing and other policy domains, from health 
to education, to energy. And we see the need to create a flexible set of policy tools that recognize one size doesn't fit all, that some places need more home ownership and others need more rental, that some need more supply and others need no more demand, and so on and so on. So tonight I want to talk about what the administration has done to begin constructing a 21st century housing policy that focuses on place. But in order to build this new policy, we need to understand where we've come from. Given the recent withering of federal urban policy, it may be, seem hard to believe today, but when HUD was created in 1965, just six years after the Joint Center was founded, its charter recognized that the agency ought to not only be about housing, but also about the cities and neighborhoods and communities where that housing was located. This was due in part to the time in which HUD and the Joint Center were founded, a moment when America's cities were literally burning, rendering the connection between the state of housing and the urban neighborhoods around this housing impossible to dismiss. But for a variety of reasons, some of which will become as evident as I continue, this broader mission has been rarely pursued and little fulfilled. Today, HUD must recapture that dedication to place it had at the time of its founding, but in a 21st century context, rooted in what place means today at this moment in our history. Indeed, I don't want to argue here tonight on the 50th anniversary of the Joint Center that there have been three fundamental changes in the years uh, since its founding that must be factored into a 21st century housing policy based on place. First, the fundamentally changing role of government and the emergence of new actors in housing policy from the private and third sectors. Second, the changing nature of our cities and broader metropolitan areas. And third, the emerging importance of data, performance-based management, and evidence-based policymaking. Allow me to start with the role of government, in particular, the retreat of the federal government that began as skepticism about the Great Society programs took hold. As a native New Yorker, I witnessed this firsthand. I wasn't reading newspapers yet in 1975 when the Daily News published its famous headline during the city's financial crisis that read, Ford to City, Drop Dead. But I was actually sitting in Yankee Stadium during Game 2 of the 1977 World Series when Howard Cosell broadcast his famous words to millions of viewers across the nation, ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning. Even as an 11-year-old, I remember the sense of chaos that bubbled close to the surface as near bankruptcy slashed police and other services. The civic bonds that hold communities together frayed to the point of breaking. Arson consumed thousands of buildings and neighborhoods lost 75% of their populations in just 10 years. Within weeks of the World Series, President Carter visited nearby Charlotte Street and compared the wreckage to Dresden after World War II. What virtually everyone foresaw at that time, the looming death of American cities, is contradicted by the obvious conclusion drawn from the now vibrant neighborhoods surrounding the new Yankee Stadium. The failure of the federal government to act did not doom these cities to failure. As Ingrid Gould Ellen from the Furman Center writes, it was New York City's investment through Mayor Koch's 10-year housing plan that not only revitalized many of the Bronx's burned out and vacant buildings, it also increased property values and tax revenues over the long term. This signaled an emerging federalism in which states and cities reasserted their authority and primacy over the federal role. As state and local government emerged as a major driver of the production and preservation of affordable housing across the country, the private sector took a lead role as well. Whereas at HUD's founding, affordable housing was largely built, owned, and managed by government, with the emergence of Section 8 in the 1970s, the private role began to expand, first to ownership of federally assisted housing, then with the passage of the Low Income Housing Tax Credit in 1986, to financing its production. These were the tools that rebuilt the South Bronx and communities across the country. This shift wasn't just about who would be providing the resources, but more importantly, how they would be spent. Indeed, the discipline this emergence of the private sector has brought to the housing industry extends from the way affordable housing is managed to how properties are financed. Despite this and new federal programs, federal housing policy, particularly at HUD and particularly with public housing, has remained in something of a parallel universe with substantial barriers to private 
and third sector participation. Perhaps even more important than the emergence of the private sector was in fact the emergence of what I call this third sector. In rebuilding Charlotte Gardens on the street that President Carter visited, we saw the critical role neighborhood-based community development corporations played. Indeed, across the country, we saw nonprofits not only help solve problems at the local level, but go on to become key civic institutions in those neighborhoods as churches and other traditional community anchors withered away. The second big change we've seen since Hunt's founding has occurred uh, at the city and metropolitan level. Perhaps to over oversimplify, when, where cities were seen as problems at the time the Joint Center was founded, today they are seen as solutions. Cities from Boston to Salt Lake City to Seattle were losing population from the 1960s onward. But in the last decade, we've seen them and many others growing again. Indeed, there's a growing recognition that cities are more attractive places to live as we've begun to reach the limits of a process that began with the invention of the automobile and continued as federal transfer, transportation investment shifted away from transit in the urban core toward highway construction and the surrounding communities. What has perhaps been most illustrative of this issue is the clear connection between development patterns that are the least sustainable with poor access to transit, jobs, good schools, and communities hit hardest by the foreclosure crisis that has plunged our economy into recession. At the same time, challenges we once associated with cities have become suburbanized, not just foreclosures, but issues like homelessness, joblessness, and immigration. In almost every respect, the distinctions between cities and suburbs and the challenges they face are blurring. In fact, in many ways, the most important frame for place today is the metropolitan area. Reflecting a trend that began at least a half century ago, today there are more people living in metropolitan areas than at any time in our history. 90 cents of every dollar in the economy is generated by metropolitan areas, and these same communities house more than two-thirds of America's population, radically altering development patterns in communities across the country. At the same time, an important trend contributing to our evolving structure of metropolitan areas is the emerging awareness of the global threat of climate, climate change. As economist Ed Glazer pointed out in his presentation before the Furman Center, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste conference in February. The connection between housing policy, land use, and climate change is profound. Suburban communities tend to produce far bigger carbon emissions than cities, largely because homes are bigger and commutes to work uh, are longer. But if we've learned anything over the last half century, it's that sustainability is about more than just energy. It's also about opportunity. The groundbreaking research of scholars like William Julius Wilson has taught us that the ravages of concentrated poverty in our cities, poverty that often emerged as a result of government housing policy, not in spite of it. Wilson and others showed the important connection between concentrated poverty and a range of outcomes such as education, earnings, and health. At HUD, we learned from our moving to opportunity experiment that one of the biggest impacts of moving public housing residents to low poverty neighborhoods is improvements in mental health because of the sense of safety, safety and optimism they find in their new surroundings. The third change we've seen is the emergence of data, performance-based management, and evidence-based policymaking. The information society, which my two boys, seven and 10, take for granted would have been hard to imagine at the time of the Joint Center's founding. Indeed, the emergence of technology has changed every facet of our lives, including government, hard as that is to believe. It was the introduction of the CompStat criminal justice system in New York in the 1990s that communities began to use data to enhance accountability in the public sector. At the same time, there's been a broad shift at the local level toward using data to craft housing policy as well. Homelessness is a perfect example of that. Uh, it, it's a perfect example of the kind of evidence-based policymaking I'm talking about. Tracking the homeless across a broad range of systems using their social security numbers and other key data, researcher Dennis Colhane was able to prove that combining housing and supportive services not only led to better outcomes for the homeless, but also saved the taxpayer money, reducing the strain on, on shelters, jails, and emergency rooms, and giving us the model we needed to move the needle on chronic homelessness nationally over the last decade. That would never have been possible 50 years ago. Each of these changes, the emergence of new actors outside of government, of metropolitan regions with new city-suburb dynamics, 
and of data and evidence-based policymaking points to the need for the federal government to step forward in a new direction. Even as we've seen state and local governments nurture innovation in their communities, with their tax bases decimated, the federal government must now reassert leadership, as it has before in our history, to pull us back from the crisis at hand. At the same time, neighborhoods, communities, and metropolitan regions alike are struggling to manage forces beyond their control, from the global flows of capital and people and the traffic and pollution that result to the loss of major industry. Only the federal government has the scale and mechanisms to deal effectively with these forces. As clear as the need for a new federal role is, just as clear is that it must embrace the changes I've discussed. This isn't about returning to the old way of doing business, the one-size-fits-all approach in the development of public housing or urban renewal. It's about using new tools that help us partner with local governments in ways that recognize the variations of place and the communities we all serve in one way or another. That is the new federalism. To help build this new federalism, President Obama has just ordered the first place-based review of all federal policies since the Carter administration, asking each agency to determine whether our, prior our policies enable and encourage locally driven, integrated, and place-conscious solutions or obstruct them. Even before this place-based review is completed, let me use the remainder of this lecture to lay out a number of examples of what we are doing in the Obama administration to realize this place-based approach at three different scales and to show how they link back to the broader trends I've mentioned tonight. At the building level, we know housing can be a platform for driving other outcomes, that housing is not just a typical market good, but a place to anchor services and where different policies central to opportunity can be overlaid. Two articles and an editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association within the last year have shown how so-called housing plus services can improve health outcomes at the same time they save money for the taxpayer. These linkages and others are only possible with today's access to greatly enhanced data. And it was third sector actors, nonprofits and foundations, who helped develop supportive housing and drive the 10-year plans to end homelessness in nearly 900 cities and counties across the country. Under the Obama administration, our new federalism will scale up these linkages using, using national mainstream medical and service programs. Another example at the building level showing how we're using an inter, interdisciplinary place-based approach to achieve multiple outcomes within a single intervention is home energy retrofits. As we've seen by retrofitting low-income housing through the Recovery Act, not only can we improve energy efficiency and reduce carbon emissions, we can also improve the economic security of families when we prove savings can exceed investment and create jobs where, when overbuilding has left workers supported by home construction unemployed. With the right effort on the part of government to leverage data and, and information, we believe these in interventions can go even further to unlock a self-sustaining private market. That is the idea behind our Energy Innovation Fund, which would jumpstart an energy efficiency mortgage product for homeowners and a municipally driven program for single and multifamily property owners to wrap energy improvements into property tax assessments where the upfront cost can be amortized. With better, with better data that proves these investments pay for themselves in the long run, we believe these tools can unlock a much broader scale of transformation, driven not by the public sector, but by private investment. The second scale of place that I want to talk about is the neighborhood level. In architectural circles, the debate over housing at the neighborhood level has often been focused on how the HOPE 6 program has demolished public housing, with its superblock models of Le Corbusier replaced with a regular street grid, porches on the street, and shared public space. But tonight I want to talk about place in a different sense that is less discussed, how neighborhoods can be a platform for a new kind of what I call sustainability. That is the goal of our Choice Neighborhoods proposal. Hope 6's focus on transforming troubled public housing necessarily meant that our work was carried out with public housing authorities, which are creatures of state and local government. While the nonprofits and private sector that have emerged in recent decades have participated in Hope 6, too often the federal government has placed barriers in their way. With Choice Neighborhoods, they will be full partners in this transformation bringing to bear private capital and mixed-use, mixed-income tools. 
Indeed, by expanding the range of activities currently eligible for funding in HOPE 6 beyond public housing to include all housing in a neighborhood, Choice Neighborhoods would capitalize on the full range of stakeholders we know are needed and want to be involved and help to build truly inclusive, sustainable communities, not islands in a sea of need. Critically, Choice Neighborhoods would link housing interventions more closely with intensive school reform and early childhood innovations as communities are already beginning to do at the local level. From Charlotte's first ward place development to Boston's Mission, Maine, which is closely tied not only to schools, but to some of the best hospitals and universities in the country. Example after example in communities across the country has shown us that the correlation between successful housing and good schools is not just theory. It's practice, and it's time to bring that practice to scale at the neighborhood level. The third level of place I want to talk about is the city and metropolitan scale. Here, the federal government can be a key partner, and the time has come to reorient federal policy to view cities not as the problems they were at HUD's and the Joint Center's founding, but as an asset and a solution. To see cities, suburbs, and the rural areas around them as an integrated whole. Those are the goals of our Sustainable Communities Initiative which will provide $140 million in planning and challenge grants to communities across the country that connect our housing investments at the federal level to transportation, land use decisions, and philanthropic and private investment at the local level. Driving zoning and land use reform at the city level, this initiative will ensure that we get the density that we need to be environmentally sustainable, but also the greater mix of uses and incomes we need to become socially and economically sustainable. At the metropolitan level, we've seen a wave of innovative connections between transportation and land use emerging from innovative state and local government partnerships. For example, under John Hickenlooper's leadership in Denver, the city and the county are linking the city's downtown to surrounding communities with a new multimodal transit system bolstered by a fund to acquire and preserve affordable housing. Our Sustainable Communities Initiative will support these kinds of efforts, and to ensure that they do, HUD has formed a partnership with the Department of Transportation and EPA, just as cities and surrounding suburbs have around the country, to begin targeting our investments at the federal level for the very first time in a coordinated way. Not only does this begin the process of helping communities manage development patterns that offer more choices at the regional and local level, it's also the first step in a broader reform of our block grant programs. We will also be focused on ensuring institutional capacity both inside and outside of government at the metropolitan level. This will not only require significantly reforming metropolitan planning organizations, it will also require HUD to encourage metropolitan level housing organizations which can facilitate greater mobility of re residents with vouchers and other tools. But this isn't just about reforming government institutions. Just as with energy at the building level, we need to use advances in the private sector to foster greater sustainability in the connection between housing and transportation. Today, the average low-income family spends nearly 60% of their income on housing and transportation combined, their two largest expenses. And yet, because mortgages don't factor transportation costs, housing finance has continued to drive the construction of housing, often in the least sustainable places. Using detailed mapping of transportation costs, we're developing a transportation efficient mortgage that accounts for a home's proximity to jobs and schools. Using advances in data and private sector actors, this is an example of a new place-based approach that will bribe, drive much broader change than government could alone. Of course, these are but a few examples of how we are reorienting the federal government's work toward place and incorporating the most significant changes in factors that are affecting housing and community development over the last 50 years. And I, don't pretend to, I, and I don't pretend to suggest that they will solve every challenge our communities face. I frame this discussion to be at, about housing, place, and a new federalism. I hope I've shown that housing is a key platform because it is so rooted in place, with the potential to over, overlay multiple policy goals with a single intervention. That's always important, but particularly so at a time fraught with so many challenges, shrinking revenues, and as I've described, a very changing world. At this extraordinary moment in our history, we have an opportunity to build a new federalism and do things very differently. It's not just about government being be too big or too small. It's about government being the right kind of partner that can help places arrive at the right kind of solutions 
more efficiently, and more effectively. We live in an age in which technology has made information more accessible than at any time in our history. Our charge today is to turn that information into knowledge. That begins with the interdisciplinary thinking practiced by the faculty and alumni at the Kennedy School and Graduate School of Design, whose extraordinary knowledge base has been acquired through practical experience, sitting at policymaking tables at the federal and state levels, working with nonprofits in the private sector to design new neighborhoods. Indeed, that, this is what sparked my interest in housing as a platform for place-based policy when I first joined the Joint Center almost two decades ago. Ultimately, it is that research and that knowledge that will allow government to play this role and for this new, federal, new federalism attuned to place to emerge. In the days, weeks, and months ahead, may we work together to ensure that it does. Thank you very much. Secretary, outstanding. Secretary Donovan has agreed to stay a few minutes and answer some questions or comments or observations on his remarks or anything else you want to talk about. So let's open it up to anyone who'd like to speak. Yes, sir. Jim. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I've been waiting a long time to hear a federal official talk about zoning. <laughs> Would you say something about uh, how you might provide incentives that would encourage communities uh, and metropolitan regions together to think more about zoning since it does play such an important part in the shaping of place? Is this, uh, can, can you hear me? Yep. Great. Um, my experience most recently uh, at the local level uh, made me really understand in a way, frankly, that I didn't from time uh, here at the GSD, at the Kennedy School, or even at the federal level, that uh, really land use is king when it comes to driving housing affordability uh, and, and so many other things, the inclusivity of our neighborhoods and communities. Um, and I, I would say there are really two things that we need to do at the federal level, because frankly speaking, we're never going to get to a point where federal policy drives zoning. It's the most closely held of perhaps all of our policy areas. But I, I would say two things about it. First of all, that it's remarkable to me how little capacity there is in many state and local areas to really understand how to construct an effective zoning policy. And I don't just mean that uh, from a density point of view, uh, but in terms of uh, mixing uses, mixing incomes. And I feel very strongly that the federal government can be a partner to help uh, share best practices and help communities that are struggling to understand how to implement, uh, e even that have the right intentions at heart to, to implement uh, those kind of advances. I, I think second of all, we need to figure out how through, starting with the kinds of investments that I, I talked about before, sustainable communities, to expand uh, and support those practices that are, are, are the best practices, and ultimately, in the long run, uh, to incorporate those into the kind of planning that we do at the federal level. It, it's sort of amazing to think about the fact that we require every city and state that gets community development block grant money to put together a comprehensive housing plan for that community. Every five, uh, it's a five-year plan. The Department of Transportation does the same thing for transportation investments every four years and every 20 years, or, or they're, they're four-year and 20-year plans. We have never actually sat down with the Department of Transportation to integrate these plans in any way. Um, and so, shocking, we're now sitting and talking <laughs> with Department of Transportation officials about how to link up our planning requirements. So it's not just a $150 million investment to help those places that are already have already begun on this, but actually to spread those practices broadly across the country. It, it's going to be, uh, let's be honest, it's a difficult balance of carrots and sticks. Um, ultimately, I think there is a limit to what the federal government can do on that front, but I think both through uh, kind of supporting and sharing best practices and driving integration of particularly housing and transportation 
planning with zoning uh, through our, our joint planning processes, those two things are the best levers that we have on that front. Yes, Bernie. Mr. Secretary, uh, my company is quite involved in the NSP program. I'm also chairman of the NSP Michigan Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Right. For those of you who don't speak HUD. <laughs> okay. I'm also chairman of the Michigan State Housing Development Authority. And one of the things, there's a great opportunity out there, and there is a program for it, but it's hardly used, and that's the conversion of Section 8 buyers, Section 8 renters, particularly those that are in public housing right now, being converted to buyers. Uh, we have taken some people out of public housing who didn't have Section 8, but were there. And we found that there's a lot of people with very good credit that are in public housing. And with the NSP program right now, with so many houses, I'm from the Detroit area, so you can imagine how many houses, <laughs> we could literally close public housing and convert those people into neighborhoods where they all wouldn't be living together and all feel that they don't have opportunity. We've seen firsthand how people feel after they move out of public housing and how excited they are. And the 140 that Mishta has done in that conversion, 100 of them don't even ask for Section 8 anymore. Very successful program. And it's not being used around the country hardly at all. Um, I'd say a couple things about that. First of all, I, I think you're right that it is a real opportunity. And one of the things um, I, I get frustrated about the nature of some of the debates that we've had about what led to this housing crisis, um, I, I don't think fundamentally that the lesson we should take out of the housing crisis is that low and moderate income people can't be homeowners. Uh, in fact, my experience was we, we created about 17,000 units of homeownership, created and preserved about 17,000 units of homeownership for low-income people through the housing plan that we put together in New York. At the time that, we le that I left to go to Washington, there were five foreclosures out of those 17,000 homeowners. This is about homeownership of the right kind at the right cost with the right mortgage products, and we shouldn't uh, abandon the sort of economic opportunity that homeownership creates for the lowest-income Americans. So I think Public housing uh, residents certainly should be part of that. On the other hand, what I would say, with over a million units of public housing in the country, I also don't think that the answer to public housing is home ownership alone. That will serve a, a portion of them. But fundamentally, we've got to think about transforming public housing, I think, more along the lines that I talked about before, not abandoning it, not uh, sort of converting everyone to sort of 40 acres, uh, their own single family white picket fence kind of vision. I think it has to be about creating uh, rental housing that is integrated economically, that has access to decent schools, the services, a range of things. And, and, and frankly, I think rental housing has been for too long uh, left out of our national housing policy conversation, and that we have to have a more balanced federal housing policy that includes rental as part of the vision for what uh, those communities become, not just home ownership. Frank. Mr. Donovan, you were describing how the world has changed in the last 50 years. 50 years ago, it was the cities that were in distress. Well, I mean, if you're in the mainstream housing industry, which is serving uh, the market that, um, the mainstream market, it seems that the crisis is really in places like Loudoun County in Virginia, where uh, you have all these foreclosures occurring, uh, the industry is decimated, and I'm wondering how the programs you described, the HUD programs you described, affect that, relate to that, address the, the, the problems that exist it, it really in the suburbs now. Um, first of all, I, I think there's a danger maybe in oversimplifying anything, and I, you know, we just talked about Detroit. Clearly there are still cities that are struggling desperately with the foreclosure problem. But uh, the point that I made in, um, in my talk was it has, I think, exposed the unsustainability or the lack of sustainability in a set of places where we have driven housing policy. I mean, I've, I've 
you get to travel a lot in this job. I think I've been to 28 states since January. Um, and to see the suburbs of, of Las Vegas, uh, to see what's happening in those communities is really, it's eye-opening, uh, to say the least. Um, I think there are a couple places where we can make a difference. Uh, neighborhood stabilization, uh, which uh, somebody referred to earlier as NSP, is a $6 billion effort to help buy up the, those homes, and not just to resell them, but in some cases, I've, I've had conversations with uh, the mayor of, of Las Vegas, uh, mayor of Phoenix, about literally buying up whole new subdiv subdivisions uh, or planned subdivisions and converting them to very different kinds of land uses, parks. I, I think that, and this, this comes back to the idea of what, what, role, what role does the federal government have in planning many of these places? I think we need to provide the support for places, not just uh, the new places that uh, are struggling, but also the Detroits, uh, the Flint, Michigans, the Gary, Indianas, that frankly, I, I was in Buffalo the other day. Uh, Buffalo at one point had the most millionaires per capita of any place in the country. Uh, it's shrunk to about a quarter uh, of its uh, height uh, in population. And we simply don't have the tools today at the federal level to help places like that or some of the communities um, to be able to plan for a different kind of future. We can help them with the homes, and we're only beginning to be able to have the tools for them to really think about uh, what their planning should look like, what the economic development strategies, what, what a range of things are that, are that are approaches. So what I would say is I think we have a small and partial answer at this point, but I think we need to build new models. Flint is a perfect example. They've created uh, a, a land trust there that has been enormously successful in buying up those properties and thinking about alternative land uses. Uh, and so I think we have to take some of those models at the federal level and help to replicate them and support them financially as well. Rick. Secretary, you mentioned earlier that uh, the government's been buying up 95 percent of the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, uh, mortgage funds. Uh, I, Will that kind of support be continued? And what happens, uh, in your view, when the inevitable withdrawal of some of that purchasing power happens? Uh, the answer is that despite uh, criticism uh, that we often take for it, that we will continue to support the mortgage market for the period that it, that it takes. Uh, in fact, in some ways, I think the irony of what's happened in the mortgage market is that it has proved out the conception of what the Federal Housing Administration and to some degree the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were, were created for, which is to ensure that when we go through a crisis like this, that there continues to be mortgage capital available. I, fundamentally, the policy goal was to say uh, the importance of mortgage capital to Americans, America's families, America's neighborhoods is too high that we can't let it sort of disappear in a crisis in the same way that we might financing for some other set of goods. And so um, we've made, uh, under you know, often withering criticism, a continued commitment to supporting them. But I think we also we all share a goal that that support isn't needed in the long term, that it is countercyclical and that we see the cycle return. So I, I, I think there are lots of details of how you begin to withdraw that support carefully in a way that uh, allows or, or supports the private sector returning um, over time. Uh, I think we have, we can do that through policies like loan limits uh, and how we adjust those loan limits over time, um, a, a range of things like that. Obviously the Treasury and Federal Reserve, we've been working with them closely on a range of these policies. They've begun to plan for the withdrawal of the purchases of uh, mortgage-backed securities and other things. The truth is none of us has a crystal ball. And so we need to both sort of lay out plans clearly, but also be willing to adjust them as we see whether, in fact, the sort of nascent recovery that we're, we're witnessing uh, is actually sustainable. Yes, sir. directors in the country. Thank you. I chair a group of city planning directors in the country, and I'd like to echo 
the comment that was made in the opening introduction of you, that we are very lucky to have you in our leadership uh, capacity, and thank you for all that you are doing, number one. Number two is I'm sure that you perhaps are aware that at one time the federal government did have a Section 701 comprehensive planning funding program, uh, which uh, subsequently got rolled into the block grant program and essentially uh, was eliminated. And I wonder what may be the possibility for resurrecting that program and providing federal funding for comprehensive planning that was not just dealing with land use, not just dealing with transportation or health, but was basically mandated to integrate those and help develop local, federal, and state policies to uh, address urban issues. Um, well, I think that is, that's precisely what we're trying to do initially with this Sustainable Communities Initiative. So, so what we've done, uh, I talked about it briefly, it's $150 million. Uh, $100 million of that would go to support uh, metropolitan level planning efforts, the kind of thing I described in Denver, where what you've seen is not just, and it, it's actually pretty remarkable to see, you see uh, Mayor Hickenlooper sitting down with uh, all of the suburban mayors surrounding the city, N not only talking, they actually like each other, and they talk regularly, and there are each of these suburban mayors, even when they are not getting uh, one of the uh, rail spur lines uh, into their community, those communities have actually voted uh, for a small sales tax increase to support it because they understand, I think increasingly, how the health of their communities from an economic point of view depends on uh, creation of this uh, enhanced rail system. The other thing that's interesting is to watch how even those suburban communities are starting to reform their zoning uh, around uh, the, the stops of both the light rail uh, and the, the commuter rail. So um, I don't want to be Pollyannish about it, but I, I think there are a, a set of examples out there like that that we can take this funding and, and say, you know, Literally, as you said, there used to be at one point long ago funding to support that kind of planning. There's nothing now. When we, when in New York we were trying to put together uh, our comprehensive plan called Plan YC, which was really focused on how do you grow New York City by a million people at the same time you cut carbon emissions by 30 or 30 percent. There was this was purely city funded and frankly foundation funded, and so we can support that. I, I, but I also think very strongly that there are many places, as I said, that don't uh, understand how to do this kind of planning. They have an interest in it and taking those models and sharing. So it's $100 million for that metropolitan level. It's $40 million for city level, uh, particularly zoning uh, planning. And it's $10 million for research, uh, including on, on something that I mentioned in my remarks. Um, how do you track transportation expenses in a way that you could begin to link uh, the, the true affordability of a home through not just the, the mortgage payment, but also the transportation costs that you're, you're going to have in that location. Professor Bale. Thank you. It's really exciting to have a HUD secretary talking about place-based initiatives and about a more holistic approach to uh, neighborhoods. On the choice neighborhoods uh, front, I'm wondering how uh, the same amount of money that's been funding Hope 6 can be used to take on the schools and all of the other uh, assets of neighborhoods. Uh, are, you, are you looking forward to a time when more than $250 million a year can be put into these? And it doesn't seem like it can help very many places at that, yep. at that scale. I think it's a, it's a fair point. First of all, um, what we're proposing is slightly more than double uh, what Hope 6 has been funded at for the past few years. But I think more importantly than that uh, is two different directions. One is, um, you, you may have heard the president talk about something called promised neighborhoods. Uh, the Harlem Children's Zone in New York, which I got, had the great fortune to work closely with when I was there, is a pretty remarkable effort that literally takes kids just about from the day that they're born and follows them all the way through college, connecting them you know, in a very place-based uh, setting, uh, 125th Street uh, in Harlem is location. It's got a very clear boundary, and they're tracking every one of those kids uh, in that neighborhood and, and connecting them to a broad range of 
services, educational opportunities, athletic opportunities, health, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, and by the way, the data now show that it's dramatically improved their graduation rates and uh, not just high school graduation, but college graduation rates. So uh, it's something that we are uh, scaling up at the federal level. We're going to pick 10 places around the country, first of all, to replicate that. And there is significant funding in the Department of Education's budget uh, to do that. We're linking that to our choice neighborhoods, kind of catchy choice, promised neighborhoods. You might have uh, gotten that. Um, so we're, we're linking those together. The other thing is, and this is something I, I sort of touched on it but didn't talk about it significantly, the enormous power of philanthropic funding and innovation over the last few decades uh, is something that the federal government hasn't tapped at all. In New York City, we actually had a fund set up where we brought tens of millions of dollars, even hundreds of millions of foundation funding into our efforts. There was no even legal structure at the federal level at HUD uh, to take that funding in. And it was just a sign of how little focus there had been on connecting to philanthropy um, to fund a lot of these initiatives. There's an enormous amount of interest in these uh, promised neighborhoods and choice neighborhoods. And I, I would expect, based on the early conversations that we've had, that we may be able to as much as double the, the initial funding that we have uh, for the program uh, to be able to uh, s expand the impact that it has. What I will say, though, frankly, is that uh, we also have to prove that these work. And I think there is a danger uh, at the federal level, a a a anywhere in, in life, not just in, in the federal government or local government, in trying to take this on in too many. This, this is hard work. And it is, uh, we know how it works on 125th Street in Harlem. Uh, we don't know what that means necessarily for Detroit or Los Angeles or, or a range of other places. And I think we've got to be careful and we've got to, uh, to go back to what I said earlier, we've, we've got to have really rigorous efforts to study these interventions to understand what's working and what's not before we scale them up to a point where they're in every neighborhood. Because I think that's, frankly, potentially a recipe for failure. Secretary, your permission, I want to take the next couple of questions just from students. So are there any students here that have a question? Yes, Ivan. Secretary Donovan, thank you for coming today. As you know, about a week ago, the High Court of the State of New York ruled that the landlords of Stavisontown and Peter Cooper Village illegally raised the rents on a number of apartments, um, illegally deregulated a number of apartments. And while tenant advocates celebrated it as a victory for tenants in need of affordable housing, uh, a large number of real estate industry executives decried the decision as a sort of a move against the preservation of affordable housing of expiring use. What is your thoughts about the consequences of the court's decision and what it'll mean for the future of affordable housing, especially preservation of aging affordable housing? Um, interesting, you should, interesting you should ask. I, I know more about the arcane legal foundations of that decision than, you know, I, would, I ever thought I would know and that I would ever want to know. It's, uh, it's a long and tortured history of uh, that's happened. Um, what I would say is that, first of all, and I can, now that I'm no longer in that job, I could maybe speak a little more uh, frankly and publicly on it. Um, I, I think the legal decision is, is the right on the law. Um, so that's first and foremost. Second of all, I think it is clear that it will benefit um, a set of residents and I think that in the long run, and I don't want to get into the details too much, it's a fairly narrow decision. It, it affects um, a specific group of rent-regulated apartments that have gotten support through tax subsidies in New York City. So this is not you know, completely rewriting rent stabilization as we know it. It, it will benefit a set of residents, and it will um, hurt pretty substantially a set of buyers who, frankly, overpaid for properties anyway. Um, and I think even without this decision, those buyers were in significant trouble uh, anyway, and this will only exacerbate it. I, I think it's a narrow enough set that I don't worry 
about New York returning to the state of the South Bronx in 1977. Um, but I do think it will, will have some impact. Honestly, what I would say more broadly is I think that uh, maybe to be a little bit provocative, uh, rent stabilization is a little bit of a red herring in terms of affordable housing. That what we're talking about is whether somebody is paying $3,000 or $2,300 for a two bedroom in parts of Manhattan. And rent stabilization, while it is an important um, tool, I think, in continuing to have a mix of incomes in a set of New York City neighborhoods for a Chinese immigrant who arrived to this country two years ago and is living in the basement of a loft building in Chinatown with 18 other construction workers or the average family facing you know, serious affordability constraints in New York, rent stabilization is not the central issue. And I think it is, it is a small piece overall of what needs to be done to really create a more, uh, to, to have a, more, a robust affordable housing policy in New York City. So let me, take let me one, leave it at that. Let me take one more student question. Any students? Yes. Uh, hi. My, my question, uh, good evening, Mr. Secretary. My question is about one of your pre predecessors, um, Ms. Catherine Austin Fitz. Um, for those who might not know, she was the former assistant secretary of HUD under the previous administration and developed a software program which would allow Americans to search um, for the entire HUD budget by the address to which it was appropriated to, after which she was promptly fired. Um, what do you make of her accusations that your budget is opaque as a matter of policy? Um, <laughs> opaque would be one way to describe it. Um, you know. I think this is, maybe to go back, let me take your question and expand it uh, a little bit. I talked about the incredible power of data and data tools that we have today. Um, I, I think we are just beginning to understand and to use those uh, effectively in ways that frankly are incredibly helpful to citizens and incredibly painful for governments. Uh, I'll just take an example of the Recovery Act. So the president has said over and over again, um, you know, this is going to be the most transparent spending we've ever done. We literally have a website today where you can go and track uh, every single dollar that's being spent uh, through the Recovery Act. And it is putting us in, you know, very frankly, uh, touchy situations at times in terms of both wrong data, but also in terms of being accountable for things that we were never accountable for. So as hard as it is to sort of sit on my side of the, the table inside government with this transparency, um, it is incredibly, the reason it's uncomfortable is because it is incredibly powerful and something that uh, frankly, I think we ought to be doing as much as we possibly can of to make sure that both the good and the bad of what, what government is doing is, is available to folks. Now, I think the, the most important thing is, frankly, going beyond just saying, what are the dollars, where is, it, where is it going, but to actually begin to use the kind of data that I talked about earlier to understand impacts, right? It's one thing to say, We've spent, you know, seventeen dollars on this project in this town. It's another thing to say, well, what impact did that project in that town have on the obesity of kids that live nearby, or on their graduation rates, or on how often they have asthma or visit emergency rooms? And that's the kind of thing that I think we can really begin to do, and that is incredibly powerful in terms of driving investment. I talked about earlier, there's one housing program that grew under the last administration at the federal level that was investment in homelessness. And it was because we had the data, not to oversimplify, it's because we had the data to show that these investments were good for human beings that were you know, marginalized in our society, but they're also good for taxpayers. And 
that we could show the kind of savings that you got from the outcomes that you, that you get there. So that's, for me, that's where I think we really need to go uh, in terms of driving data at the federal level. Secretary, sensitive to your schedule, I'm going to take the prerogative of this chair to ask you the last question, if I may. It is 2016. You have just completed eight years of outstanding public service <laughs> the Obama administration. <laughs> How do you want HUD to be characterized? At that point in time, if people were describing the, the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, what would that description be? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd go over on that wall and I'd take a nap like my uh, <laughs> colleague uh, that I described earlier. Um, you know, it's interesting. We're, we're actually going through this process right now at HUD. Um, David Osborne, who wrote Reinventing Government and a, a range of others are, are helping us kind of put together a vision for what HUD should look like uh, about eight years from now, so seven years from now. Um, so I, I would want to come back and talk to you a little bit more about that. Uh, and I'm not, because I don't have a, a complete picture in my mind. I think it's really, what we're going out literally and asking residents of our housing, mayors that we work with, people around the country, what, what their vision is. But I, I think I would say uh, a few things to begin with, that this is a HUD that at, at the most basic level, is, is the true sense of the word partner. Uh, frankly, the federal government, and this is not just for HUD, but we've gone through a period in, in, in our country, and I talked about the sort of withering of the federal role. There, there's a fundamental question about whether the federal government is actually a positive force in people's lives and in, in communities. So whether it's for HUD or, or anybody else, I think it's the sense that, hey, we're not just there to you know check the box, um, sort of regulate you, but we're actually contributing, whether it's on zoning, uh, energy efficiency, all of these other things, we're, we're actually contributing knowledge and skills that help people, local communities improve, right? And so that's, that's sort of a, a fundamental level. Um, I also think that if we if, I, if you think about not so much that sort of base level partnership, but on a programmatic level, clearly it has to be that we've not just recovered from the current crisis that we're in, but that we've helped to construct a more solid foundation uh, in mortgage finance and more broadly in terms of the way that we design communities along the lines that I've, I've talked about tonight. Um, and that part of that is we're contributing significantly to less uh, carbon emissions in the country. I think that's very important. And then I think, second of all, that we have real measurable outcomes to be able to say our housing isn't just a decent roof over people's heads, but hey, because we supply affordable housing, kids do better in school, they're healthier, um, our residents are more likely to get jobs, all of this kind of uh, overlaid and interconnectedness, the interdisciplinary approach that I talked about, that we're actually having measurable impacts on, on people's lives. That I know, I'm in housing because I know housing can have that impact. Um, for too, too often, federal housing hasn't had that impact. And so I wanna be able to actually measure that difference when I, by the time I leave, that we're, we're having that kind of impact. Anyone can get there, you can. Let me, if I could, um, give you this small gift on behalf of your family at the Joint Center for Housing Studies. Thank you very much. I do that. And a little birdie whispered to me that while you were here, you were president of the GSD Student Forum. So on behalf of the GSD students, I want to present this T-shirt to you. Please join me in, well, in thanking. Thank you. Thank you.